it's the next level. People long for life before the freeze. But I don't know. I might like this life better. I think of my mum. Chain smoking at the kitchen table. Fresh bruises under last night's makeup. Keep your head in a swivel, she'd say. Because trouble comes sideways. It's a zero sum world now. You set a thing in motion and watch it tumble down the line. All that's coming is coming head on. The whole great shit show flattened down to a single line. Hey, panelers, welcome back to the show. I'm Mark. And I'm Daphne. Wow, we got Daphne here. This is my friend Daphne. She sent in a lot of feedback for Snowpiercer so far. Uh, she's filling in right now for Steve. So this week, we're going to be doing episode six, Trouble Cone Sideways. And Daphne, what was your initial thoughts of the episode? I really liked it. I think that as a whole, the show has done a great job of weaving stories in and out. So just when you think they've finished something, you start to think, Wow, I wonder where they can go next. And then they've already got another one in the works that they planted seeds on way earlier. Mm. So I'm really excited. I think in the future, I just really am hoping that they'll show us how the people boarded the train mm. and how much each class knows about each of the numbers in each of the other sections. I feel like there's so much meat there to be told, and I really hope that since they've given us those glimpses through Leighton's dream state, that maybe we'll see some more from that. Oh, definitely. But my thoughts were, I thought it was just cool that we got to follow up from the last episode. You know, we only got to hear about Andre's rescue through conversation at the very beginning of this episode. And it just basically pushes the story and opens up, like you stated, another one after the investigation has ended. So basically, they've opened up yet another Pandora's box of issues of what's going on within that train because with the whole political client climate that's going on within the actual train itself how people are reacting between third class all the way up to the first the separation of classes in itself and a revolt possibility so you know there's a lot going to be going on and there's so much that they could write from this standpoint and i really enjoy it for that purpose so basically we're gonna Give a synopsis, and I would like you to give a synopsis of Episode 6, Trouble Cones, Sideways. Okay, the synopsis for this episode was, Hiding out with help from his allies, Leighton lays track for revolution. An engineering emergency threatens every soul on Snowpiercer. Awesome. So with this, we're going to go right into our top fives, because tonight we're actually doing six and seven. So keep that in mind, listeners. So I'm going to start off with, we're doing a top three, because we're actually just, you know, we're doing two episodes. So with this, I'm going to start off with my top three of episode six. Good evening, passengers. Be advised... Track conditions will deteriorate over the next 24 hours. And that would be... Andre explains that Mr. Wilford is not on the train and that Melanie is just acting like Mr. Wilford. The truth is out there for someone else now at this point, and I hope she can comply with his demands to hold on to that truth. And mind you, this is pr for this particular episode itself. It's the conversation that Leighton had with the first person that when he awoke, so... I really am interested to see where this story goes because Melanie is such a complex character character and i'm yeah. not sure how she's <laughs> going to react to him knowing the truth about her situation oh definitely i yeah. i definitely believe that she is balancing all of these different roles and trying to keep things going but it's really difficult to do because there's just so much unrest across the whole train 
And so she's trying to keep it together, and it's just really complicated. Yeah, it is really complicated in the sense that if you look at Melanie, she's juggling different roles at this point, different masks to present in front of people like Jinju, Leighton. The workers in front, like the engineers that are actually, oh, the conductors, I should say, at the front of the car that she's involved with. And then <laughs> there are other people as well, as far as the people that are just the patrons. You know, you got the, the people in third class, second class, and first. And there's a lot of people. Now she has to act like the person to give information to these people at every morning with her announcements. And then next thing you know, she has to present herself as pretty much like a command presence in front of these people at, at certain times, as well as try to take charge. She's got a lot on her plate, but I have a funny feeling later on down this road that we're actually going to, or I should say tracks that we're on with this train, that's going to break down this woman in some respect where she's going to have a breakdown or something's going to falter and somebody's going to just dig deep into her. But that's just my thoughts. I think too, though, that she has to have a really good memory to think about who she's with and what they know and what they don't know. Hmm. And she, it's like she's got a mental spreadsheet in her head of all of her communications and all the people she talks to and how she needs to communicate with them. And it's really interesting to watch her try to balance everything while still keeping control of the situation. She's juggling it, on that train, if you think about it. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So what was your number three? My number three was actually the drawers. What are they for? Creating the system suspension state and Melanie's confession about the drawers as a whole. Mm. We knew that there were 400 of them, but we really didn't know. I personally was assuming that they were a lot of, they had a lot of unrest and there were prisoners in those drawers, but that's not the case at all. She told us that those drawers were keeping people in mm -hmm. suspension and that they would be brought out at a later time. Oh, like a demolition man thing, like I actually spoke about last episode of this podcast. And I really enjoyed that thought. And that's something that actually Steve brought up to me. And, you know, he mentioned it when we first started before actually we first started podcasting about it, saying it just reminded him of Demolition Man. And wow, he is correct in that sense. And yes, uh, like some sort of suspension to keep them. Maybe Wilford himself is in suspension. I'm wondering about that myself. So. I, I did like her interaction with Leighton with Andre Lane when she was explaining to him, even though he thought that those drawers were some sort of hell, <laughs> she said, no, they're not a prison. It's a lifeboat. So I think in the future, we're going to hopefully learn more about the drawers, how they came about. And why. What people are in there. Yeah. And why. What people are actually in there. Because we know that a few of Layton's Taylor friends... Mm -hmm. are in the drawers. Correct. And they were put in there as a punishment. But then when Josie went to rescue Layton, she noticed one of the children that had been brought out of the tail to move forward and have new opportunities through apprenticeship, yeah. that they were actually in there as well. So it's trying to figure that out. Why well, I think people are in there for various reasons, and I really think you're onto something. Maybe like the movie Deep Impact, when they were trying to get everybody to that mountain to be secured because they had to have scientists, people or carpenters, everything to rebuild a new society. Maybe the lifespan within the train itself is not that long. And then, you know, they need to replace these people. Maybe you're at a younger stage. Maybe just like you're stating, they were put under suspension. And yet we have, you know, people that are probably important. Maybe it's Wolford. Maybe it's other people like that were a problem. Yes, it could be a prison itself. But, you know, that, that's a good topic to bring up. It, it made me, you know, like I brought it up before in the last podcast about maybe they were trying to train these people kind of like a demolition man. It's like giving them information. So maybe maybe Melanie's feeding somebody schematics and how to figure out how to fix the train in some respect and things of that nature. So who knows? Who knows the train better than Melanie? That's my question in the whole grand scheme of things, because she really seems to know that train better than anyone else. Exactly. And we'll continue on and on to my number two, which would be Melanie's explanation to the third about the risks of striking. You know, very upfront. But sometimes a command presence, and I've stated it before, 
can cause other issues and may create more of a revolt in times. But you could see where she is. That was one of her many hats. And I really liked it because, it, uh, you know, Jennifer Connelly is a great actress and I love every character that she's done so far, including Spider-Man <laughs> Homecoming when she was the voice. I actually, you know, enjoy the fact that it showed her in a different spotlight in comparison just to the announcer. We've seen a little snippets of her taking charge with certain things and actions with Leighton, but in this case, it's like pretty much a command presence right in front of the third itself and how she had to speak to them as a representative, quote unquote, of Mr. Wilford. I think, too, though, with all of the unrest that's going on in third, especially after the verdict, not specifically the verdict of the trial, but the fact that Mr. Wilford had decided to pardon LJ and release her to her parents. There's so much unrest in third, and you can totally understand why they would want to be revolting at this point. And Melanie coming in and talking to them, I feel like it got across to them. Mm. But at the time I was thinking, I'm not sure I would stop revolting. It's such a difficult situation because they're in a moving object. <laughs> There's, you have to, everything you do is like moving pieces on a chessboard because you know what can happen if you're unsuccessful. Yeah. But you also are hopeful for the future. And I feel like Jennifer Connelly is killing it as Melanie. I think she's shown such a great range of emotion, but yet still keeping herself under control in these situations that are almost impossible. And I'd like to know if she'd teach a class on how to juggle all these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of us need that. <laughs> we all nowadays. need that. We definitely yeah. all need that. <laughs> what was your number two? My number two is actually this question of will they show us? Melanie alluded to the fact that everyone made choices when they left to get mm. onto the train. They left loved ones behind to be on the train. They made sacrifices. And so... Her speaking these words just made me start to wonder even more, and I know I mentioned it earlier, are they going to show us these things? Are they going to give us more of a visual representation of what happened? How did the Tailies get on the train in the first place? Were they just people that ran up, they broke through a barrier, and they're trying to get on? I'd really like to see more visualization. I loved the pieces that we saw last episode of Leighton and his dreams, and I really just want them to dig deeper into that. Yeah, I agree with you. They they showed us a little bit of that in the very first episode when they had what was like kind of an animation of the story through Leighton's voicing a narrative of what's going on and how they got on. You saw people charging for the train just to jump in and just try to get on, but you didn't really see the actual interaction of trying to get on, attacking people or just trying to take over. Did they kill anybody? Did they literally, was it moving at that point? Or they just took it over and was were forceful. And a lot of the people, as we know, Leighton is one of those that is somebody who is needed in society in the real life before everything went to the freeze. They already had blue collar workers, as I like to call them, because people that are very much important. You got your carpenters, you got your mechanics, you have your engineers, you have your police, you have your firemen. Everything that, you know, society kind of relies on, even probably the medical community, you know, were on there, but they weren't regarded in high standards for the fact that, oh, you have to be this, you know, high presence of a doctor in order to do that. You have to be this big distinguished engineer, but they kind of left all those other people down. But what happens when those people die? All you have is what's in left in the tail. And, oh, so they move up or do we put them in suspension and leave them on so when that person dies, we just take them out and, hey, you're the new person, but we're going to keep you here in this car at this point, kind of like a prison because you didn't have the money and you just jumped on our train. But we'll find out later on, I'm pretty sure. I'm sure they're going to give us some sort of information regarding that, but I have a funny feeling with the way – shows are written and we've seen this in other shows like the 100 and a whole bunch of others where or even the walking dead that are similar in dramatic 
and what is required of people within the storytelling, we'll get little bit of snippets of what's going on, probably more individual standpoint or something like that. I look forward so, to that. I hope that we yeah. do because I'm I'm piecing these things together in my head as I'm watching. Oh, same here. Uh, one of the reasons I used to um, I was a big fan of Lost when it came on, and I feel like it changed TV because it made you have to start thinking when you were watching TV. Oh yeah. And I like shows that make you that you are watching and you're trying to put the pieces together in your head while you're watching. And I, f I feel like Snowpiercer gives you nuggets every week. Exactly. And you're putting them together yeah. and trying to figure out, well, what does that mean? Or will that tie in later on? And I like that. I'm excited about the show for that reason. Well, I'm excited too. But the funny thing is, is with this show, like any other show that we've watched that uh, we kind of binge and or just watch regularly... You know, you have deaths, even in Lost, you had people dying. Same thing with the 100 and Colony and stuff like that, where the the drama just keeps rolling, but they, you had a pertinent, you know, particular character that they just take away. And it's like, how did they survive after that? Because they needed that character. Where do they go from there? And, oh, we brought in this other person. So, yeah, it. I'm curious to where they're going to go, because obviously we do see a couple of people go on the wayside during this episode and next episode that you're just like, did I just see that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> We're not used to seeing it, I think. Well, that's it's the only... whole thing. We A lot of those uh, shows actually strayed away from it for a while, if you think about it. So now it becomes like, oh, this is new, but it's kind of similar to the same format, but it but it keeps you intrigued because where are they going to go next? What are they going to do? Almost like a cliffhanger at every given point of an episode. I like that. It makes me excited to tune in every week. Exactly. My number one would be Andre and Josie's little celebration. I'm I'm hoping they that they will stay together, but we'll find out in the next episode when we talk about it. Then the scene with Melanie and Miles, how she gives him that little key of, of like of an engineer and states there is something that Mils Mr. Wolford actually needs from you, and that one saying means that they're prepping somebody to be put in a drawer. Agreed. To be used later, you know. Agreed. I'm wondering what it is that she conveyed to him about mm -hmm. what Mr. Wilford needs because like like we've talked about already it's little cliffhangers and you're just not sure what <laughs> what it is that is being talked about in secret and I'm really curious because she is a complicated secretive hard to understand character at times and I'm really interested in seeing how Miles will react to that because he's he seems very loyal to the tale seems very mm -hmm. loyal to Josie and Layton and wanting to do what's right for for them and his friends at the tale so I just want go on, I really wonder how he's going to balance the two Melanie's request with what he knows the tale needs Okay. So what was your number one? My number one is the supporting cast. I feel like we, there's a lot of attention on Melanie and Leighton and Josie and some of the other characters, but I feel like the supporting cast, like Bess Till, Oz, Miss Audrey, and Zara, I feel like not a lot of attention has really been put on them and they really have important parts to play. And I feel like there's even more that we're going to learn about them in the future as episodes continue and they keep digging deeper into them. I'm really excited to see they each have just different roles. Now, most of them are in the third class train cars, but yes. with Till and Oz having this, they're brakemen, they're the ones that are trying to keep order. I'm just really interested in seeing in the future how those characters continue to develop because I feel like there's so much more we have to learn about them, but it, I also feel like they've brought a lot to the table already. Awesome. So with that, that's our top three for episode six. So we should move on to quotes. This is something that Steve brought up a long, long time ago, and I enjoy it. He comes up some, with some really good ones. I'm hoping that mine are okay. <laughs> <laughs> My first one would be Melanie states, Ruth, remember calm and hospitality. Calm tree. They say it together. Calm tree. <laughs> but it's the way Melanie is utilizing her workers to do what she needs. She had to settle down Ruth, just get her to do what she needed at that point. It was, it was an interesting 
scene. It's another one of those things that Melanie does to manipulate and get people to do what she needs to do. She has a great way of doing that. Yes. <laughs> she entranced. I don't know if they're just entranced in what she is saying to them or if she's just got them so conditioned to yeah. everything that she says being an important thing that they need to tackle next. Uh, do you have one? I do. I liked this one. This is one of my favorites. Leighton said this to Dr. Pelton, who is trying to help hide him during this episode. Mm -hmm. And she mentions to him that she now is a marked person that they're watching. And he said to her, it gets real simple, doesn't it? When you're the one they're coming for. So he kind of jabs at her, I think, in that way. Mm -hmm. Because I think it is easy for those who are on the train to not really step in to help others because they're not being watched and they're not being persecuted and they're not on the list to be sent to the tail or to the drawers. But when they are singled out and they are being looked at as a potential revolutionary, things change very quickly and they're more eager to help others because they think it might save their own skin. Very true. <laughs> My next one would be Melanie saying, I designed her, I'll fix her. And that was about the train. So now we know Melanie was the designer all along, apparently. Maybe truly a Wilford or some sort of relative because it is Wilford's train. So maybe there has to be some sort of family member there. I wondered about that. I wondered if she was one of his nieces or his daughter or someone close to him that he worked with to create the train because she designed it. Mm -hmm. And she's always running around in these sweatshirts from different universities. I don't know if you've noticed that. Yes, I noticed. But she's <laughs> <laughs> she's always running around in a different it's like Yale, sweatshirt. Princeton, all these other places. It's like uh, how many how many schools did she drop out of and go to or maybe she finished and went to the other. Who knows? I know. <laughs> Was she a perpetual student? Probably. To learn everything that she needed to know in order to create this train. Um, so hmm. I really want to see how much deeper it goes between her and Wilford. Oh, definitely. Same here. You, do you have another one or no? I do. I actually had used part of it uh, earlier. Okay. When Melanie and Leighton were talking about the drawers and she tells him the drawers aren't what you think. And he says, the drawers are hell and my people are still in there, which he said with a lot of urgency and a lot of frustration. And she says, they're not a prison, they're a lifeboat. And I feel like there's more we're going to learn about that. But I also feel like that was a way the two of them connected. Ultimately, he decided to let her fix the train and save everyone's lives. However, I think he was conflicted because he really, well, all he really wanted to do was save his friends yeah. and take her and take her out so that the train can move forward in a different direction. Awesome. My last one would be Audrey stating, the celebrations will end, but the grievances won't. And that was to Melanie regarding the third. I feel that this will actually come on more and more as, you know, the show progresses. This is just the beginning of what's to come, in my opinion, especially if Andre has a hand in it. And we will find that out at the end of episode seven. So Absolutely. I did have one more, and it was Oz saying to Till... While the train was going completely crazy, <laughs> they were trying to, <laughs> to brace themselves for what could come. And he said to Till, to climb, someone else falls, to gain, someone else loses. And I think that really sums it up nicely about what this train is all about. I think class-wise, if you look at how things are laid out, it really is about pushing someone else down so that you can get ahead or not. Mm. Not caring about the person you push down so you can get ahead and putting yeah. yourself first, I guess. Kind of like those people that jumped on third and maybe stomping on others to get to the train to get on. Exactly. So we have additional notes that are well, weren't covered in our top three for episode six. Daphne, you want to start and then I'll take one after that. I realized this last week that the show was actually developed by Graham Manson, who was the mastermind behind Orphan Black, which is another show I love, and another show that made you think every week about what was going to happen next. That had a lot of twists. It did, it <laughs> did. And I feel like um, another thing that it did well was it 
set things up as you were going so that you didn't even realize that a bigger story was getting set up mm -hmm. while you were following the trail of the one of the storyline you were on. And I feel like they're doing a lot of that in Snowpiercer, and that may be why I'm really excited about the show so far. Awesome. I'm always excited. But now it's like as we get deeper into the show, I get a little bit more excited based upon each episode. Obviously, episode six got me going because the, just the visuals alone. So my next pick for one of my notes that I didn't really bring up in my top three would be the quick shift on the train when the train started failing when Leighton accosts Melanie before she gets to the hydraulics. It's kind of those action sequences that are lacking in some shows at this point and this they really dropped it on us on this episode because we see a lot going on and we see a lot more that's going on in the outside too i like the views from the outside yeah i think that that definitely helped for me too and we talked about this already is melanie's continued manipulation <laughs> to balance the scales between the classes mm -hmm. and i feel like the near derailment crash distracted the passengers from their planned work stoppage so it's kind of like the smoke and mirrors by accident yep and she's juggling to keep everything going while she's walking on a tightrope and I just think it's all going to come crashing down at some point. Oh, well, she'll drop a few plates, I'm pretty sure, but not all of them. She's got to hold on to a few. <laughs> I think I think you're right. I only have two more. Uh, the next one would be Melanie wanted to do the repairs on the hydraulics. Even the workers did not want her going there because they can't afford to lose her. She made herself so much of an importance on that train that even those underground, I call them underground, even though they're under the train or in the deep depths of the train, didn't want to lose her. No, we'll do this. No, I have to do this. And that's when she stated the quote I gave earlier. It's like, you know, I designed this train. I need to fix it. She's the one who knows it best. Exactly. It's one of those people that, you know, it's they have to take charge because they created it. And it's, it's kind of like an opinionated thought. But, you know, they, they have a little ego about it, <laughs> in a sense. And sometimes egos have to be crushed at times. Absolutely. I think she w is the one who knows the train best. And she probably felt she was the only one who could go down there and actually fix it. But mm -hmm. I think also seeing the reactions of the people around her, that they did not want her to go because of her importance, not only for understanding or knowing the train, but for keeping things going. Definitely. I, I really like that. My next one would be the images were amazing. We You already spoke about it, of the outside of the car, though, as well as under below when Melanie was trying to get the hydraulics back together. You know, throughout the episode, you see the shifting, how the train was trying to reconnect when the hydraulics kicked back in and all that stuff. You can see the scope of what they are facing externally on the train itself. For the past five episodes, it was mostly concentrated inside the train. But now we got a good view of what's going on on the outside. And the cool part of it, and I, I like the idea, and you and I talked last night about how, uh, and I brought it up saying how it looked like Speed, the movie Speed, and Keanu Reeves underneath the, the train. And there Melanie was trying to get, instead of a fuel line, he was trying to fix, uh, fix a fuel line and Speed the movie. Now she's trying to fix that hydraulics to keep the train steady on its rampant course at a high speed and a high velocity, just like in the movie Speed. So I, I thought that was pretty cool to think about, you know. It would be funny to see Keanu Reeves on this show, though. <laughs> I think he could bring something interesting, but he'd definitely have to be somebody who's already in the drawers, because I don't think anything's living outside of that train. Oh, I know that. Yeah, it has to be somebody that's hidden within. And I'm pretty sure that we're going to see more characters like Stephen Ogg and the rest of them that we've seen briefly for a moment for previous episodes come back in some way, shape, or form. I certainly hope so. I think there's more story to tell. Yeah, definitely. So the synopsis for episode seven, The Universe is Different, states Melanie's intensifies her search for Leighton, who is weaponizing her secret. The third class faces a reckoning when Leighton presents them with a choice. So this one is a really, really good episode, everybody. Taffney, I know you enjoyed it immensely, so... <laughs> I really did. I thought that it's been the best one so far. I feel like there were so many great moments and 
they're again they're laying the groundwork for the future and i'm on the train i'm fully invested and i want to see where it goes and with that we'll get started with our top three good evening passengers be advised Track conditions will deteriorate over the next 24 hours. And Daphne, you should go first. All right. My number three was music, music, music. I feel like the music on the show has been incredible. But at the end of the episode, Miss Audrey gave us a rendition of Bad Religion by Frank Ocean. And it really made my heart sink at the end, knowing how much we actually did lose in this episode. Mm. I think, yeah, I think the music on the show... Right from the theme to the covers of other music selections, it all really fits really well. And last week, I actually found a Spotify playlist that has all of the music. So that is pretty exciting. Awesome. You got a Snowpiercer playlist. There is. <laughs> there is. And I've gotten really comfortable with Bear McCreary because he's been doing the the music for Walking Dead and a couple of other shows. And so mm -hmm. just listening to how different the music is for this show, but still equally as interesting and thoughtful for the different scenes, I really am, my appreciation for his work is growing. And my number three would be the discovery of Leighton being missing from the drawers, the suspension drugs missing as well, and leading Melanie and company to start searching and basically interrogating people like the janitors to figure out where did he go and to see that dripping scene of, you know, a bullet hole and everything dripping down and how it caused a ton of chaos on this train. It really did. It really did. And I, I think that Melanie, in this episode, this is the first time that I really saw her a bit more raw and a lot less mm -hmm. composed. Exactly. In the past, she's always kept her composure throughout the entire situation, no matter how dire it might seem. But this episode, I saw some cracks in, in who she is. You saw the personality within the person uh, other than the front that they present as like, you know, everybody has a presentation when they're, they're doing something, whether on the phone, when they're doing cold calling for it's like, hi, I'm so-and-so, Mr. Representative. Very much like what she does when she does her announcements. And you get to see the personality, the actual person in her interactions with people that she's kind of familiar with, like Jinjo. Yeah. And that engineer guy. Her, yes, <laughs> she does love him. That That's pretty obvious. I think the one thing that really struck me is when she was torturing Josie. Mm. And then she had to leave the room to go and vomit because it bothered her. It's not what she wanted to do, but she felt driven to do it because she didn't have a choice. She's trying to protect herself and protect the train. And while I think her mind is in the, or heart is in the right place to want to keep everyone alive, I think she has to reconcile with some of the things that she has to do in order to make that happen. And she still views, she views Leighton as a threat the information he has as a threat. So finding him is her most important mission. Yeah, well, considering that she utilized him as a tool to do what she needed for the murder itself. So now it's like, oh, wait, I need to get him because he's got some information and he could be a, a, a troublemaker at a later time because with his investigation skills, he probably figured out a few things. So that's why they put him in the drawers initially. So now she's got to stop that. So what's going to happen with Leighton? She's going to aim and murder for him or is she going to just put him back in the drawers? Well, because that kind of control is going to be hard to do when, you know, he already got out of the I drawers. And I think he's too important. For her, I think she knows he's important, and I think she's conflicted about what she may or may not have to do to him, because I think she knows he's a huge asset to have, but I feel like she wants to have him in her pocket, and he's not willing to get in there. So, that puts her in a hard position. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Absolutely, you know. absolutely. That old saying. So, what was your number two? My number two is Got a Secret. I feel like Leighton's gamble to tell LJ about Melanie 
being the sole queen of the train and there not being a Wilfred, no matter where he is, mm. that is a huge gamble for him to play. Because one, I don't know that he, that he knows what she'll do with the secret. But then also, I think he does know that she's very calculating and she will use that secret to her best advantage. Mm-hmm. So I'm interested to see where it plays out because I can see LJ... She's she's a character that it's hard to describe her. She's crazy that, pants city. That's all it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I really think, you know, she's grown up in a family that's allowed her to get away with doing things that are outrageous. And that is true. They continue to allow her to do that, despite the fact that she obviously has some real se- serious deep rooted issues. Oh, definitely. I would say so. <laughs> uh, but I think that this could be a gamble that pays off for him because I do believe she'll think really hard. I do think she'll try to play that secret at an important time. And I just want to get the popcorn and watch it play out. Oh, definitely. Because she had a bit of taste of fear for herself because at one point they were looking to get rid of her, if you think about it. So she had that deep rooted fear like, you, no, your parents have nothing. Nope, nope, nope. And then. Obviously, she was granted something in the end, but hopefully that laid in something where it's like, oh, I have to use this to my benefit or whatever, and maybe she'll move on. Maybe she'll be helpful, but it's kind of that Harley Quinn Joker kind of aspect about that kind of sociopathic, psychotic that you just don't know. You're just going to roll the dice at that point. So well, I hope that we get to see something to that respect. Me too. I think she's unpredictable and she's shown that throughout the entire season so far. <laughs> right from the beginning when we met her, I just had a feeling about her that I couldn't shake. Oh, definitely. And I wanted to see more and figure out who who is this girl? Why is she so off? What is going on? And she's a bit creepy. That that whole she's eyeball scene creepy. was yeah, yeah that whole eyeball <laughs> scene was like creepy. Yeah, I think she's definitely one of the creepiest characters that I've seen. Yeah, on cable on cable TV. So <laughs> I'm definitely yeah, I want to see what she does next. Oh, you haven't watched Batwoman, I guess. So you didn't see Alice. <laughs> I have not seen that show. <laughs> What's your number two? My number two would be uh, Ruthie's little date. Her explanation in history of how she got on Snowpiercer. And her experiences, you know, with Mr. Wilford, how she met him. She managed the Airbnb that he had, and apparently he had no reservations, but, you know, she was able to accommodate at that time. It made for an interesting story, and it was very sincere, so it made me believe it. So I like that. I feel like she was at the right place at the right time. Or was she? Yes. Did Wilfred know something about her that he felt she... I mean, I don't know. And some... Maybe he sought her out and he just happened to show up and this is my thoughts on it and... Yeah, I'm really interested to see. Again, I feel like these seeds get planted and (laughs) who knows if they're going to grow or if it's just something that we're reading into a situation. And that's part of the fun of watching the show. Definitely. And your number one? My number one... This was actually the easiest thing for me to come up with because (laughs) it's been an ongoing trend in this whole series, and that is the environment as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Before this episode, we've seen what the external elements can do. Mm -hmm. Loss of limbs, loss of a whole car of, of, of cows, which is a whole other thing that they've had to deal with. Yeah, where's the Um, meat? Where's the meat? (laughs) (laughs) And to my knowledge, none of the folks really know that that car of cattle has been lost. So that I think is going to come up later on. We've also seen how Melanie has used Mm -hmm. the elements to injure or maim misbehaving passengers as a way to control them. Mm -hmm. And ultimately in this episode, I'm sad to say, Josie, she died because Melanie tortured her first Mm -hmm. and then she killed her. Well, Well, she killed her because Josie was retaliating. (laughs) <laughs> true true but i think josie knew i think i have a feeling that josie knew oh definitely she was not going to make it out of that room alive so she had to try to do something and i'm still blown away that she had till freeze her entire hand so she could break it free Ugh. that i i just it blows my mind and i feel like i'm not sure of the actress's name that plays josie but i feel like she did a really good job in this episode i feel oh, like yeah. 
I saw the terror on her face. Yeah, it was uh, that scene was really well done between both of them, and she presented that fear greatly, I thought, too. I also think, too, that Melanie going and throwing up after just the torture piece, I think Melanie has a conscience. She does. And that's the whole point is like, no, it's like somebody who has no conscience, no empathy, no feeling wouldn't have done that. That's just showing that she had to get her hands dirty. She really, I think deep down, didn't really want to go to that extreme. It just happened to happen that way. Yeah, I don't think she's but, a barbarian. I think that she was no. put in a situation that she felt that she had no choice. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. Josie died. And I'm a bit bummed about that because I really liked her as a character. I wanted to see where things went. But it also reminded me that this show, you can't get comfortable because you do not know what's going to happen next. <laughs> It's like you're sitting in the train and it's shaking all the time and you're like, oh, darn, when is it going to stop? <laughs> well, might not be a train, could be a roller coaster. Who knows? Because <laughs> the speeds. My number one, well, I'm going to agree with you, using the outside environment as a way of torture, execution, and passing judgment. This is the same as Daphne's, but I agree completely with all your thoughts, Daphne. But I, I think that it it's like what the tribes used to do, you know, that sacrifice a virgin in a volcano, you know? Sometimes those stories and books about those events were meant to mislead you. Now, maybe that's what they're doing within this story with the people within the cars, because we already saw somebody lose their arm as a form of punishment. Now they're just going to utilize the environments, that, that element outside as a way to either execute or to, like you said, discipline them. So it was meant to make you think they believed in what they were sacrificed for because, you know, that woman that lost her arm in that one episode did it willingly. You know, she was forced to push her arm out there. Yes, but it's kind of ingrained into their society in a sense. You know, hence why Melanie uses these tax tactics just to create order on the train. So I'm pretty sure that's why. And I think. Hake brought it up last week when we were podcasting about, he goes, why would they have those in those cars? Why would they just happen to have those? And, you know, they were there purposely to do something of maybe not that particular nature, but they are there. But, you know, as we see, I wouldn't be surprised we see more of this going on, like those little spacesuits that she had, like the spacesuit that Melanie was wearing when she went underneath to help fix the hydraulics. Is somebody going to go outside of the car in a future episode, maybe go up on top of the train as it's racing and be chained to go down? Is there some other thing that we're going to get to see that's pretty cool like that? I would love to. Yeah, I love the direction and the potential for different directions that this show continues to set up. I think that the environment, the elements, the frigid temperatures, I mean, beyond frigid, let's be honest, beyond frigid temperatures, <laughs> you, they're using the environment in a way that makes it exciting, but also terrifying at the same time. Oh, definitely. So that's it for our top three at this point. So we can move on to quotes and I'll start. And my first quote would be Melanie stating, it's your day off, Ruthie. Enjoy it. And that was Melanie to Ruthie uh, after Ruthie just watched Melanie make the announcement as she usually does. I feel that Ruthie may be a little suspicious of Melanie in some respect and who she is and what she does, or maybe a little greedy and wanting to have that role in itself too. You know, I want Melanie. Melanie's role on the train because she got a little bit of a taste of it at one point. Agreed. I think that she definitely was able to get a taste of what it would be like to be in charge. I think that it was an impo it was a difficult situation because they weren't even sure. I think Ruth did not even know if they were going to survive that. But she had to put on that brave face and yes. prove that she actually could do it. And mm -hmm. I think that that goes a long way for her character. I, I think there's potential there for her. But I'm still not sure how... I'm not convinced yet. I want to see how things play out first before I make a decision about whether or not I think Ruth could be could take Melanie's role because I'm not sure that she actually can. I don't know that she has the stomach for it if she finds out exactly what Melanie's had to do. Yeah, I don't think so either. My quote is actually the opening monologue that LJ gave. To be human is to be self-involved. Everyone believes that they're the center of the universe. We can't help it. It's in our nature. We scheme, we plot. 
We play our silly little games. Like, why do we think we're the most important thing in the world? We're just not. Exactly. I feel like that really hits on each of the classes in a different way. I think that the folks in the first class cars think that they are the center of the universe. But they're not. <laughs> but they're not. And it goes back also to me thinking about, well, how many passengers are actually in each of those sections? Mm -hmm. And is one person, whether it's Melanie or Ruth really going to be able to balance things if those passengers in the lower cars, the tail and third, where there are substantially more people, really going to be able to hold off a revolt from those cars? I don't think they can. And I think that's why Melanie started to crack this episode. I think that she realizes what is at stake here and trying to keep things level. And so that's why she put so much effort into finding Leighton, because he can completely blow up the train with this secret. Hmm. My last one would be Audrey saying to Andre, what do you think I've been doing here lately? And Andre just saying, politicking. <laughs> During a little conversation about where he was, what happened, and everything else, and him questioning what's going on. I've never heard of anyone stating something like that before, and I just found it humorous. <laughs> Well, if you look at things in like in the United States, in our government, we've all been having conversations about the political situation. Correct. Here. Yeah. Politicking really refers to senators and Congress and everyone speaking to each other and trying to figure out what is the best thing and not coming to the general conclusion without having those discussions. And so I think that's how that ties in. It really is politicking. I, I've actually heard it before. It's been a term in a sport that I cover and but I hadn't heard it in this context. So I was inter I'm, I'm intrigued to see. Yeah, same here. And your last one? My last one, I think, was another really, really awesome one. And it was when Leighton said to LJ, I've been thinking about you and how much you like dirty little secrets. <laughs> how would you like to know the dirtiest little secret on the whole damn train? And her expression when he said that to her was priceless. And I like the drama and I want to see this. I can't wait for the episode. Yeah, same here. Uh, that, that was like a bomb just dropped. And it's like, mic drop, dumb. And then... You know, cliffhanger. <laughs> now we have to wait until Sunday. Yes. <laughs> so we got a little bit of feedback. Uh, this was from Brian Constant, and he emailed us last week for the last podcast. But this week he goes, I know you guys aren't on this episode just yet, but wanted to send a quick note. So you can save this one until that time which it is. Really enjoy listening to you guys. Keep up the good work. He basically states, Episode 2 taught us that there are 3,000 people on the train. Episode 3 taught us that 70% of the population in, th in the third class and the tail. And Episode, I guess, 4? Has now taught us that there are 400 in the tail, leaving 1,700 in third class and 900 between second and first class with hundreds in the drawers, likely most of which are from the tail and third class, and not likely actual ticketed passengers, so. Wow, well thanks Brian for sending that in and breaking that down, because that's been a question that I hadn't taken the time to sit down and figure out, but that is really exciting and really ties to what we were talking about just a little bit ago about the number of passengers in the tail and third class and how they really outnumber yeah. the first and second class passengers. Well, thanks, Brian, for that. If you send more, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Basically, Steve's not here this week. So again, he sent in some voice feedback. So he's out on the road with family on vacation, but he got to see episode seven and this is his audio feedback. So Daphne and I are going to listen it right now, just as you are. Well, hello, Paranormal to Pixels. This is Steve. Uh, hello, Mark, and special guest co-host. Thank you so much for filling in for me as I'm on vacation with some family. I uh, did get to watch uh, Snowpiercer Season 1, Episode 7. This is this is Steve, if I hadn't already said that. And uh, there's a lot going on in this episode. You know, we learn a whole bunch. We see that Melanie Campbell has uh, levels. She's not just good or bad, I think. Um, so we're, we're going to find out more going forward. We're definitely getting close to the end of the, the season. 
I loved her talk with, with uh, Terrence and when he started with the, just that very simple, the, is there a janitorial problem? Uh, I really thought was, was pretty cool. But then, of course, she turns his hands over and she knows that he's not really a janitor. But, uh, uh, yeah, really, really good. Uh, sad that we saw the death of, of Josie and that uh, we know Leighton is now uh, grieving for her. I think if, if you do the math, uh, obviously, I think we're meant to at least think, if it's not true, right, that uh, the baby that Zara has is his. Uh, and so we'll get to see that play out as the rest of the season goes, I'm sure. And uh, interesting that uh, the person he chooses to tell in first class is LJ. So if he's actually going to tell her the real secret of the train, I guess we'll find out in the next episode or uh, later on down the road. Love that... Uh, uh, Till is now an honorary Taylor, and the reason she's an honorary Taylor is because she does the right thing. I thought that was really, really cool, and uh, just that thought of the fact that because you did something decent means you're for the downtrodden, you're for the workers, you're for the people who need to be saved. Okay, uh, I can't wait to hear this episode, and I can't wait to get back uh, on the podcast myself. Talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, for sending that in. It's interesting he amazing. shared some of the opinions that we've been talking about. Yeah. And I definitely am excited to see where Till goes now that Josie has mm -hmm. talked with her about being there for those who need them and knowing what the right thing to do is and wanting to do the right thing because I think I had it in my notes. Actually. Oh, we could always go straight to our notes right now. Let's do that. Yeah, let's go. Cause I do have it in my notes. I do have it in my notes. So Melanie's threats to Zara about, be about pregnancy being a privilege and not a right. That was mm -hmm. terrifying because Zara had no choice. She had to give up Josie. <laughs> as mad as it made me. She had to do it because Melanie was threatening to kill her child before it was even born. And so she didn't have a choice. But I also think now that the Tailies are not going to look like... They're not going to look on Zara no. in a positive way. And Leighton had been pushing and saying, well, Zara is one of us. You know, I know she's up there, but she's one of us. Well, this really... I mean, they all saw her come down there to take Josie away. So that's going to be really oh, difficult to get across, yeah. I think. And Josie's conversation that she had with Till just before Melanie came back in the room, I think, I hope, energized Till to bring her into the fight by telling her that doing something to fix something that wasn't right is all you need. That's the only reason you need to be able to move forward and do hmm. good. And I still kicked myself because I had gotten comfortable with this show. And when Zara and Melanie came and they took Josie away, I did not think that she was going to die. I'm still really surprised that it happened. It was a huge shocker. And now it's put me on edge just wondering who's next in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. And you could correct me on this, but... My the only additional note I have would be Miles getting sick. Josie, is it Josie that states it or is Zara? Jos I'm it's thinking Josie it tells him that she was sorry for making him sorry about making him sick. I thought so. I get it's funny. I keep getting confused between <laughs> the two of them. It's the weirdest thing. <laughs> well, I, I wonder at some points in this series if Leighton has gotten confused between the two of them because he's gone. <laughs> yeah, right. He's got. Back He's and gone forth. back and forth already, and now we have a child on the way. And is it his? I think I don't know. I, there's really no breakdown of time, so I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a lot of breakdown in time, especially since he was put in a drawer for a while. Yeah, who knows what she was up to? And then, you know, who knows? So just basically that that whole scene. So it was planned so she can see him. She fills him in on a few things. Uh, the Melanie's workers see that conversation, get a little suspicious. I just like how he constantly calls her mom through it, though. That was that was interesting, nice, but sad in the same time at the very end at this point. I appreciated that dynamic between the two of them when it was going on. But then I loved it even more by the end of the episode when we... 
when I realized that Josie was not going to survive. Yeah. I think it was really special that they had that interaction. And I just, I'm wondering what Miles is going, how he's going to react to knowing that Josie has died. And how he's going to find out, because it seems like he's going through those two those doors mm. to engineering, and I'm not sure how there's connection. Yeah, they, as far they're as they're just going to indoctrinate him and basically brainwash him at at a certain point. He might not know anything, and then if Andre comes out of somewhere, he's going to be like, "I don't like you anymore. I'm not going to bother with you. You're not my father figure. This person is." I'm curious if they go into anything further within that because you could you already start to see it at a certain point. So right from the beginning, because you notice they cut his hair when he came out of the tail. Exactly. And then they started to mold him into what they have for their their the children. They were all very neat and clean. They were proper and, prim and doing what they need to, doing their studies. He was very adept at doing better than most of the students there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really interested. I I feel like the show every week gives me a lot to think about and makes me wonder what's going to happen next and leaves me with questions. <laughs> so I could say that's your uh, thought of the episodes as a whole, both of them. Yeah, I, I can't. Con yeah. yeah, I can't continue I so. saying this any more than I have in the past. I'm enjoying the show every week. It keeps me captivated and makes me want to watch it even more when I can. So work makes it a little bit hard at times because it comes on a Sunday night and then I kind of miss it for some odd reasons and I have to watch it a day or so later or something like that. So, but I make time for it during the week when I can. So that way, when we come to podcasting, we could actually do it at a, a decent time. So that way we could actually do the podcast itself. I would like to watch the episodes a couple of times because there's some things that you just miss every time you do a first watch that you just, you really, yeah. You really do there are things that that you may not miss but they just look different the second time that you yeah. watch it and for me the bar is set really high with the series that i'll actually make time to watch and this is one that i will do that because i feel like it delivers oh it does week. definitely does deliver and that's that's what got me glued to it not because i have to podcast about it it's because i'm actually interested in it and like i said last week i'm so glad that steve brought this up to uh and suggested that we podcast about it. Just can't wait for him to come back so that way he can get his voice in on this because he's been gone. This is the second episode. Steve, why are you on vacation? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he's When he comes back, things a lot has happened, but it sounds like he's really kept up with what's been going on and watching the show. So I'm interested, too, in hearing yeah. when he gets back. His thoughts on everything that's transpired, not just in his messages that he's left, but also just hearing his voice and as you talk about future episodes. Definitely. He could throw out like a short synopsis of thoughts for the last two episodes or three that he hasn't been on. So those were the two episodes that we just covered. Awesome. And thank you, Daphne, for being on. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. So with this week, we got a little bit of comic talk. And within Comic Talk, we talk about what's going on in movies, shows, comics in general in this world. It's just a way to entertain you as well as podcasting about the shows we like. So Brie Larson was Captain Marvel in the cinemas at one point. So now she's a YouTuber <laughs> because as you could tell, nobody's filming anything. So she took it to herself to took to herself to actually do a YouTube channel just called Brie. And it's just her opening up to the world. I guess there was a lot of criticism in the world. So she felt it's a way for people to get to know her. Uh, suppose it's like, supposedly it's about things that she knows, a little bit of technology, getting to understand about YouTubing and all other things. A lot of people have been saying that this was more professionally done. Uh, maybe a publicist was used, but honestly, the fact that she jumped into it just to do it and even though she got some help i i appreciate that but she also was on the youtube channel hot ones first we feast and this was done in her home so it was meant to promote the youtube channel i suggest everybody go watch it it was pretty cool to watch her eat vegan nuggets 
with these hot sauces and everything and go through the hell that it is. Oh, wow. I, re- yeah. I thought she was fantastic in Captain Marvel, and I definitely will have to go check out her YouTube channel. Yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I have not subscribed yet. Oh, I, no, I did subscribe. I haven't watched the episodes yet. So they are going to be coming on a weekly basis from my understanding. So check that out if you guys are Brie Larson fans uh, or, or even, you know, the hot ones. The first we feast, that's something that I like to watch too on occasion because I like hot sauce. There's a place in Connecticut called the Angry Pepper that I go to, and I have a plethora of hot sauces in my house that I use. So check that out and check those shows out. The next up, what we have, uh, Negan Lives came out, and it was really good. It was nice to have a Walking Dead comic book back since the series basically was ended last year, right around this time. And I was able to get a hold of a gold variant of that one comic. And wow, the prices have gone up on these variants that are out there. I'm hoping they do continue with the actual series as it is, because even this one issue, and this is not a spoiler, it kind of leaves you off at There's something else that could go on. So if Robert Kirkman and Adler would actually do another one, that would be amazing in my opinion. I think so too. It was a great issue and it really did leave it open to something more. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't he do this specifically for comic shops? Exactly. It was a comic shop only release. So you had to buy the comic at your local comic shop. And that was to support the comic shops to keep them in business. And as far as I know, when I went to my comic shop, they didn't have any new Marvel or DC releases because they had issues with distribution, but they did get The Walking Dead. They did get image related comics. So I'm not sure what's going on with Diamond Direct or whoever's distributing for certain companies, but that made a lot for comic stores at this point this week. So I'm glad that came out. And the last bit of news would be apparently Ryan Reynolds is pitching the idea to be in the Snyder Cut of the Justice League movie. That would be really interesting if they actually did that. I I think it's funny since he made that go back in time and credit scene with an uh, Deadpool. Oh, I think it was Deadpool too. And he shot Ryan Reynolds himself as Deadpool reading the script of Green Lantern. He's always poking fun of it because even in the first movie, he's like, oh, don't, don't give me a suit and don't make it animated. <laughs> you know, that, that whole line. You know, though, he can't really complain because he did meet his wife while he was shooting that movie. <laughs> Just saying. I know. Just saying. <laughs> uh, he was also in a joke YouTube with Hugh Jackman, Halle Berry, Patrick Stewart for the X Men reunion when he just crashed their Zoom call <laughs> and in on it uh, within the past week. So I thought that was pretty funny. I said su- I suggest everybody check that one out too. It's funny how you see Sir Patrick Stewart, you actually see Halle Berry, you do see Hugh Jackman. And there was a couple of others, but Ian McKellen was not there. It was just an image of him. And he just, oh, he goes, was that Sir Ian McKellen? Did he just leave? <laughs> and he goes, and he was like, what are you doing here? That was funny. I did check that out. And it was quite humorous. I think things like that right now just bring that little extra levity while we're all going about our daily lives. So yeah, that was definitely funny. Yeah, we need that. So at the end of the show, we usually have podcast recommendations. Do you have any, Daphne? Well, I can promote my own podcast because my friend Alex and I are starting a podcast that is covering monster movies. Sharks, dinosaurs, aliens, you name it. And it's called Run for Your Lives. And it should be out sometime in August, probably towards the end. Awesome. I love that idea. Funny enough, because I actually considered doing something like that in the beginning myself, but I didn't. But I'm glad that you're doing and taking on that job. We've already got uh, one episode in the can, and it's been a lot of fun so far. And I've never really done podcasting, so this is something completely new for me. It's fun. That's the whole point. Get together with a friend, talk about something you like, and have fun with it. Just like Mr. Kevin Smith used to say years ago. So, uh, my one podcast recommendation this week would be Strange Indeed with Rima. And 
she has special guests every week. So she continues on with her her podcast, Strange Indeed, to do a rewatch of some of the best or favorite episodes of Black Mirror. They were voted on or suggested by listeners, so I suggest them highly on the Podcastica network. So listen to Rima on Podcastica. And I have a couple of YouTube recommendations. And the first one would be the Grim Life Collective with Michael and Jessica as they continue to do their Grim Life Up All Night or Grim Up All Night. And they have some interesting horror movies as they host on their YouTube channel as well as, you know, you watch them host and as well as you watch them, you know, the movie itself along with them. You have to have two devices, people. I highly recommend you go to their YouTube channel. Just search for it. Just Grim Life Collective. Last one would be Josh Gad's Reunited Apart. And they just did Ferris Bueller's Day Off reunion. And I was so happy to see so many famous people do a tribute to John Hughes at the end. I loved it. It brought tears to my eyes. I loved it. You know, you got to see Michael Keaton, Chevy Chase, all these wonderful people. I think the, what was it, Curly Sue. I think the the girl from Curly Sue is on there, too. And I'm just looking at it going, wow, this is amazing. And, yeah, we lost John Hughes years ago, but those movies are timeless. And I always suggest everybody go back, watch those movies. During this time, if you never watched them, go watch them now. They're available. I think that was the finale of his series because he's done a couple of others. Mm. I, th- I can't remember all of the ones that he's done, but he did like a whole series of reunions. And I think this is like the finale or th- maybe the season finale. I think it's the um, season finale. I think uh, he did Ghostbusters. He did The Goonies. Lord of the, Lord Rings. Of the Rings. And he did Back to the Future. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun watching someone take the technology that we have and use it in a way that brings a lot of smiles to people's faces. And it definitely brought a smile to mine. And growing up in that era and watching so many of his, of John Hughes' movies, it was great to see the actors pay tribute to him at the end. Definitely, yeah. Well, that pretty much ends for what we have. And to end it... To submit your feedback, we can be heard on Spotify, Google Play, Apple iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast player of choice that you use. Uh, If ratings are available, we suggest that you just give us a rating. Just be honest. Be who you are. Check out our new website, www.panelstopixelspodcast.com, and you could submit your theories and feedback. Just go to our Facebook group, which would be facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You could always email us, and that would be panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels. The two is spelled T-O, pixels, and the number one at gmail.com or you can just give us a call leave a voicemail 845-350-2095 and i'm going to do that again 845-350-2095 you can find us on youtube if you search panels the pixels podcast just please give us a thumbs up or you know if you want to subscribe that'd be awesome i usually watch a lot of podcasts on my apple tv and you know even if it's just a straight image I do that because, you know, you, some of us have surround sound and stuff like that, or big speakers that we want to listen to it. So that's a good vehicle to use it on while you have things going on around the house, cleaning dishes, doing laundry, who knows? (laughs) So that's another way of doing it. And where else can listeners hear us? Well, I just want the listeners to know that I have left Talk Through Media. I will no longer be on any of the podcasts on that network. I wish Brian, Ruthie, Kyle the best with the network and all their endeavors there. You can always hear me here on Panels the Pixels. I'm not going anywhere. This is my podcast, so obviously I'm not leaving it. And I love starting this back on December 28th, 2017. And there is more coming within the coming years. So, and there's probably going to be some interesting news towards the end of August as well. So just keep in tune, keep listening. And like I said, if you could keep sending us feedback, be amazing. So Daphne, you already mentioned you're working on a podcast. I did, and I'm looking forward to getting that out there on the airwaves or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And hopefully by mid to late August, we will debut our first episode. Yes, you will be on the interwebs, not just here, though. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our show this evening. I want to just thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Daphne. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night, everybody. Good night.